Casey. I, I just feel like it's got to be Casey. It seems like something she would do. Good morning and welcome to Jenison Christian Church. Please stand with us as we begin our time of worship. It all comes down to this. What do you require of me? Love my neighbor as myself. And you above all things. And just leave the mercy. Walk humbly with you, God, in all things, in all ways. much for being here. We're so glad to have you here in person or live streaming. Um, please just continue this time of worship with us this morning. If you walk in freedom, and if 
you bear his name sing the song forever to the lamb we'll sing the song forever and amen and the angels cry holy all creation cries Oh 
altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. you this morning and we're just so thankful that we have the promise of forgiveness from you that your precious blood paid the price for us lord please be with us this morning as we hear the message that's brought to us and just help us to be open to hear it and um, to be open to the ways we can apply it to our life and make changes in our life thank you so much for your love and your grace and help us to show that to others each day so in jesus name we pray amen again. My name is Nate Hannum, and I'm the senior minister here today. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's just like all the time, I hope. <laughs> I am today, too, but I'm not preaching today. We have a guest speaker uh, who is here today. I told you about him last week, and his name is Dr. Frank Weller. He is the president of Great Lakes Christian College, and uh, uh, one of our elders, Phil Smith, and I got to go over there last week and to meet him, me for the first time, and Phil already knew him, but uh, this is the first time that he's been back here for a long time, and we are just glad to have you come today, Dr. Weller, um, and uh, would you welcome him with a round of applause today, please? Thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, it's, it is great to be here. I was telling uh, Nate earlier, the last time I was in this room, I think was for the dedication of this facility, like 30-some years ago. And so it's exciting for me to come back and see the life in this congregation, see what God's doing here. Just really pleased to be here. And I want to say thank you from Great Lakes Christian College for the faithful partnership of this church and the difference that it has made for generations of students at GLCC. What I have planned today, I'd just like to give you just a five-minute update on where we're at as a college, and then we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2 together. So Great Lakes Christian College 
exist to glorify God by preparing students to be servant leaders in the church and world. That's what we do. We're an institution of Christian higher education that trains students to do two things. One, to be servant leaders in the church, to serve as preachers and youth ministers and worship leaders and missionaries. And then two, we exist to train students to be servant leaders in the world through our marketplace ministry programs. Students can come to GLCC, they major in Bible or they minor in Bible if they're one of our marketplace ministry programs. They have the option of either a major or minor in Bible, but then they also major in things like psychology counseling and business management or communication or early childhood education or compassionate care, which is our pre-nursing program. And so students can come to GLCC, they can study in a faith-based context, and maybe they're, they're students who grew up in a church like this one, and for them it's an opportunity to make their faith their own. They've sort of been a part of a faith family with mom and dad or maybe extended family, and now they can come to GLCC and they can make their faith their own. And so that's a wonderful opportunity, but we also see students who come to GLCC that don't have a faith background, and they're being introduced to Jesus. They're studying the claims of Christ, they're reading God's word, and they're deciding for themselves if this way of Jesus is something that they want to pursue. And so we have a wonderful opportunity to raise up the next generation of servant leaders for the church and world. And God has been good in blessing that mission. We just underwent, about three weeks ago, an accreditation review with Higher Learning Commission. They're the same people that accredit pretty much every institution in the state, Michigan State, Michigan, Hope College, Calvin, Cornerstone. They're the same accrediting agency that we all use, and they had a, a very favorable outcome from their peer review visit. And so while we've had some challenges in the past related to our finances and related to our strategic plan, Higher Learning Commission peer reviewers said that we are on the right track, and we're so grateful for that. When I became president 20 months ago, the college was anticipating a $600,000 loss for that fiscal year. And we had experienced nine out of the last 10 years where we had lost money. And because God is good and because people are generous and because we worked really hard, uh, our last fiscal year, we didn't end with a $600,000 deficit, but rather a $270,000 surplus. And we're on target to have another surplus this fiscal year, too. So thanks. Yeah, you can, that's all right. I, I cut your clapping off. Yeah, let's give God a round of applause. God has been so good to us, and we just think our mission is so important. So I want to say thank you for supporting us as a church, and if you'd like information on how you can support us as an individual, get with me afterward at the display out in the lobby, and, and I'd love to talk with you about that. The biggest thing you can do is send your students to us to be trained in a faith-based education. I saw something a few weeks ago that really stuck in my mind. It said, if you send your children to Caesar to be educated, you can't be surprised when some of them come home as Romans. And I know that this congregation believes that we want our children to grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We want them to grow in their faith. That's why we send them to Christ and youth conferences and we send them to church camp. And that's why we, when they're little, we make sure that they're in, in church and they're part of vacation Bible school. And we just, we invest in our children so heavily and then for some reason, so many people, they send them off to a university where their faith is challenged but not supported. And at Great Lakes Christian College, your student's faith is going to be challenged, right? They're going to hear some things that are going to challenge their faith, but their faith is going to be supported. And they're going to learn what God's Word has to say about the contemporary issues that we face in our world today. And we just want to teach students about Jesus and so if you send your students to GLCC, we're going to take good care of them. So uh, by the way, if you're a high schooler, uh, stop by my booth after the gathering this morning. If you'll fill out an interest card, which will, you know, we can send you propaganda about the college, <laughs> right? If you'll fill out an interest card, we'll give you a free t-shirt today that you can, uh, you can wear. Uh, we've given so many away that we have two larges and six extra larges and one 2X, right? So if you're a medium or a small, you'll get to sleep in this shirt. It'll be a nightgown. <laughs> All right, uh, let's pray together and then we're going to dive into God's word. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, what we sang earlier is so true. What a savior. You are wonderful. And we sing hallelujah today in your midst. Thank you for loving us and for giving us the opportunity to be in your family, to be with other believers, to gather today. 
I pray that we would be challenged, that our faith would grow, that we'd experience your presence today, that we'd leave this place excited about the work that you're doing in this church and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I grew up in Indiana, up in northeast Indiana. So if you've ever been down I-69, there's a little town there called Auburn, and not far from there, a little town called Garrett. And that's where I grew up, DeKalb County, Indiana. And if you go to the corner of County Road 11A and County Road 68 in DeKalb County, there's a little white church building there called Cedar Chapel Church. And right across the road, as there are in many rural communities, right across the road from that white church building is a large cemetery. It's in three sections as people have passed away over the years. The cemetery has grown. But in the oldest section of that cemetery, near the corner of the road, so in some of the oldest graves of the oldest section of that cemetery, is the grave of my third great-grandfather, Joseph Weller. He was the first in my direct family line to come to Indiana. He came to Indiana just before the Civil War. Now, his family had been around for a long time. The Wellers have been in America, at least my branch of the Weller family has been in America since September 25th, 1737. That's when my seventh great-grandfather, a man named Johann Jacob Weller, emigrated from Germany. Uh, He came to America on a ship called the St. Andrew Galley, and he landed in Philadelphia. From there, he made his way south to Maryland and then Virginia, and eventually his descendants made their way to central Ohio. A whole lot of my third cousins still live there, people that I've never met, but my third great-grandfather, Joseph, came to Indiana in 1861, and now he and five generations of my family are all buried in that cemetery. My third great-grandfather, Joseph, my second great-grandfather, Miles, my great-grandfather, Frank, after whom I'm named, is buried there. My, fa- my grandfather, Floyd, everybody called him Bud, is buried there, and as my father, Larry, as well. And someday, they'll plant what's left of me there, too. You know, I think it's so important that we know where we come from. That's kind of why I'm such a genealogy nerd, right? I think it's important that we know where we come from. If, if we want to have some sense of where we're going... I think it's really important to know where we've come from. If we want to have some sense of our progress, how far we've come, it's important to know where we began. And so I've just become kind of a genealogy nerd over the years and Ancestry.com and having all that fun and 23andMe and the whole bit. But I'll tell you, I think there's something more important than knowing your biological ancestry. There's something more important than knowing your genealogy. And that's knowing your spiritual ancestry. Yeah, we have Ancestry.com, and you can look it up and find out where your family comes from. But don't you wish there was sort of a spiritual Ancestry.com? You could kind of look back and figure out how you came to be part of a family of faith. You know, who taught you and who taught them and who taught that person? When I look back at my spiritual ancestry, I'm really grateful to be a believer in Jesus, and I'll tell you why. My father, Larry, didn't grow up in a family of great faith. Now, his mother was a Christian, and his grandparents were Christians, but his father, my grandfather, Floyd, was not, or at least not a practicing believer. My dad would be the first to admit that he inherited a little bit his father's hair-trigger temper. My grandfather, Floyd, was known as a guy who could blow his top. And he often took that out on my dad, the eldest of his three brothers. My mother, on the other hand, she was not from a family of faith either. Her parents were both brittle alcoholics who spent their short lives mired in addiction. My mother remembers, for example, one time when she went out on a date in high school and she came home and the house was locked up And her parents were too drunk to hear her pounding on the door, and so she spent the night in the family automobile. And so my dad, who inherited some of his father's anger issues, and my mother, who came from a family that was mired in addiction, they met and they dated just a few weeks and got engaged and got married. What could possibly go wrong? (laughs) It turns out it didn't go wrong. It went right. And I'm convinced the reason it went so well is because my mom and dad 
walked into the First Church of Christ in Garrett, Indiana, and met Jesus. And it changed their lives. Their spiritual ancestry is now part of my spiritual ancestry. I learned about Jesus primarily from my dad, Larry, and he learned about Jesus from a man named Jim Platner, this six foot four tall guy with size 14 shoes who was the preacher of our church in Garrett, Indiana. Jim's still alive. In fact, I'm going to be with Jim uh, tomorrow because his aunt is being buried and I'm going to visit with him at the cemetery. Um, But Jim, I, I asked him, hey, who taught you about Jesus? Because I wanted to know my spiritual ancestry. And Jim told me that he learned about Jesus from a lot of folks in Michigan, maybe some of their names you'd recognize. He learned about Jesus from a man named Lee Doty and from a man named High Gates and from a man named Herb um, McCracken. And he, he grew up learning about Jesus from spiritual brothers as well. Um, so, some guys like Jerry Paul and like John Paul Hill. And I just wish I could kind of go back even beyond them and find out, okay, my dad learned about Jesus from Jim, and Jim learned about Jesus from High Gates. Well, who taught High Gates about Jesus? Here's what I think. I think if you could go back from generation to generation to generation, you would discover that your spiritual ancestry and my spiritual ancestry goes all the way back to when Jesus walked the dusty roads of Judea with his 12 apostles. And Jesus taught them, and they taught somebody who taught somebody who taught somebody who eventually, a hundred generations later, taught Jim Platner, who taught my dad, who taught me. And now that has changed the spiritual trajectory of my family so that my children are also believers in Jesus Christ. The reason I'm a follower of Jesus and my children are a follower of Jesus is because every single person in that spiritual ancestry practiced a principle that I want to share with you today. It's an important principle And it may be, I think, maybe I'm biased, but I think it could be one of the most important principles you'll learn this month. This principle is so important that if you and I will practice this principle faithfully, the world can be one to Jesus Christ. But if you and I do not practice this principle, indeed the church could be lost in a single generation. This principle is that important. And here's what it is. If you're a note taker, get ready to write it down. If you're a memorizer, get ready to memorize it because it's a pretty simple principle but a pretty profound and important one. Here it is. Christians stand in the middle. That's the principle. Christians stand in the middle. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this principle applies to you. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, it doesn't apply to you. And thank you for being here today. Thank you for exploring who Jesus is and what his people are all about. But if you're a follower of Jesus, this principle applies to every single Christian in the room. Christians stand in the middle between the generation that went before who taught them about Jesus and the generation that is coming behind who has yet to learn about Jesus. And that can be biological generations, that can be you standing in the middle between your parents and your children, or it can be spiritual generations. Maybe you're not related biologically, but someone taught you, and now God's calling you to teach someone else. Christians stand in the middle. There's a tremendous example of that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, and that's where we're going to hang out today. So you could turn there in your Bible or you can click there on your mobile device. Now, if you're using Version or some other mobile app today, stay focused, right? Don't be turning to those Facebook notifications. I know how that works, right? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. We're just going to look at one verse today. We're going to unpack it phrase by phrase and see what we can learn about standing in the middle. Of course, you know Paul. Paul was a first century missionary and evangelist who traveled all around the Mediterranean basin. And everywhere he went, he told people about Jesus. And after he had told people about Jesus, he established churches in those towns and in those villages. And eventually, in some instances, he would, he would appoint elders and church leaders. But he also trained a generation of evangelists who did the same. And one of the evangelists that Paul trained was a man named Timothy. Timothy was the evangelist at the church in Ephesus, a city in what is now modern-day Turkey. And Timothy was 
a, a mentee, really, of Paul. Paul was his mentor. Timothy was the protege. And so Paul wrote a couple of letters to Timothy to teach him how to be a better pastor. And we call those the pastoral epistles. First and second Timothy. Paul wrote an additional letter to Titus. But first and second Timothy were written by Paul to Timothy to help him become a more effective pastor, evangelist, preacher. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul gives him this principle that, that, that I just kind of call Christians standing in the middle. Here's that verse. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. That's what Paul told Timothy. Hey, Timothy, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust those to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. That principle applied to Timothy, and because of the progressive nature of that, you know, I teach you, you teach others, they teach others still. Because of the progression that we read there, it applies to us too. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to unpack that phrase by phrase. Then we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And then we're going to go someplace and eat yummy food. How's that sound? The things you've heard me say is how Paul began that instruction. The things you've heard me say. It's easy to overlook the fact that Timothy was listening. Timothy was listening. And if you and I are going to stand in the middle between the generation that went before and the one that comes after, we've got to be listening too. And you may think, well, of course, Frank, of course we've got to be listening. And listening is the easy part. Well, you know what? It's not. It's not as easy to listen today as it used to be. At least I don't think so. Maybe you've got this great mental energy and focus and you have no trouble listening. But I'm telling you, I struggle to listen. I tr struggle to listen because there's just so much noise. There's so much noise in the world today. In fact, the people who run social media empires tell us that we no longer live in the information economy. They say we live in the attention economy because attention is the most important currency in our world. Those who run those social media conglomerates know that if they can get your attention, they'll get your money. If they can get your attention, they'll get your time. If they can get your attention, they'll get your loyalty. And that's why we're constantly competing for others to get attention. It's hard to listen in the attention economy. Here's the thing. We know that attention is a valuable commodity because if you take all the Christians together in the United States and you lump their offerings together and you do a little bit of math, you'll discover that Christians on average give about 2.5 or 2.6% of their money, of their income to the church, 2.6%. Now, for those of you who understand scripture, you're like, that's about a fourth of what we're supposed to do. Well, you're right, but that's another sermon. 2.6% of our money is what we give the church. 0.6% of our time is what we give the church. Take all the Christians together, lump up, lump together the amount of time they devote to the things of, of, of the kingdom of God. 0.6% of their time, about nine minutes per day. We know that the average teenager devotes about 60 minutes a day to this. And let's not pick on teenagers because now Apple makes it possible for us to track our online time too. And I would suggest that most of us spend a considerable amount of time, considerably more than nine minutes a day, doing this or this. Am I right? Timothy was able to stand in the middle because he was listening. And if you and I are really going to stand in the middle between the generation that went before and the one that's coming after, we're going to have to find a way to listen, church. We're going to have to find a way to shut out the noise, church. We're going to have to find a way to turn off the distractions, church, and listen to what God is saying. We've got to listen. The things you've heard me say, Paul says, in the presence of many. Let's pause there 
and then we'll get to the next word. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many. It's easy for us to overlook that Timothy was listening, but he was doing so in the context of community. In other words, Timothy went to church. Timothy listened as part of a church. If we're going to stand in the middle between the generation that went before and the one that comes after, the best way we can do that is to be in a church, in a faith community. And indeed, that's the way God created us. He created us to be in community, to live in community, to exercise community values for and with one another. This is what's terribly troubling to me is that though we claim to be followers of Jesus and we claim to adhere to Scripture, our actions seem to indicate, at least where being a part of a church is concerned, our actions seem to indicate otherwise. We know that before the pandemic, about 44% of Christians said that they were active or went or were part of a church every week. About 44%. Now you tell me, post-pandemic, has that number gone up or gone down? Right now it's about 24% of Christians are in a church gathering every week. What does it say when we claim to follow Jesus and he says, I'm going to be there, and then we're not? What does it say when we claim to adhere to God's word and God's word says, do not, in, in the book of Hebrews, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but consider how you may encourage one another all the more as you see the day of Christ's appearance approaching. What does it say when we claim to believe that, but three out of four of us aren't here every single week? I as I drove up, saw their athletic fields out here, and they were full of people, and I wondered how many of them are believers, and hopefully they're part of a Saturday night worship service. We allow so many other things to get in the way of us just simply showing up. And if you're going to stand in the middle between the generation that went before and the one that comes after, part of that means showing up and spending time back here with your children's ministry, making sure you're investing in the next generation, spending time with the teenagers in your church and making sure that you're standing in the middle with them and you're encouraging them to make their, your, their faith their own. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many. And that next word's really important, in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of many witnesses. That word witness is an interesting word comes from the Greek word where we get our English word martyr. That's the kind of witness that God's looking for. He's looking for the, the man or the woman who will be faithful even to the point of death. God's looking for the kind of witness who will say, I would rather die than reject Jesus. I would rather die than turn my back on Jesus Christ. Those are folks who can stand in the middle. And indeed, when you look back through history, you see that some of the folks who spent the most time in the middle are some of the same folks who paid with their lives for doing so. We all know, of course, that Jesus taught Peter. Peter was one of the apostles, spent time with Jesus, three years with him, became, went from being a fisher to being a fisher of men, right? Right? Not as many of us know that Peter stood in the middle between Jesus and a man named Clement. Clement. History tells us that Clement became the bishop of Rome. In other words, he was a teacher. He was a leader in, in the church that was located in Rome. Peter taught Clement. Tradition tells us that Clement was martyred for his faith, that because he refused to reject Jesus, because he refused to turn his back on Jesus and worship the emperor, he was tied to an anchor, taken out to sea, and thrown overboard. That's how Clement died. But before Clement died, he stood in the middle between Peter and a man named Ignatius. Ignatius became a follower of Jesus. He was a faithful man of God. And he too was ordered to renounce his faith in Christ, but he refused to do so. And because he refused to do so, Ignatius was taken into the Roman Colosseum to be made a spectacle of as part of games that were put on by the emperor Trajan. And Ignatius was torn apart by wild beasts to the delight of the Roman crowds because he was a faithful witness. But before 
Ignatius died, he taught a man named Polycarp about Jesus. Polycarp, too, was faithful unto death, and because he refused to renounce Jesus Christ, he was burned at the stake, and when his captors thought he wasn't dying quickly enough, they also stabbed him with spears to hasten his death. But before Polycarp died, he taught a man named Irenaeus about Jesus, and here's the thing. Irenaeus taught someone who taught someone who taught someone who a hundred generations later taught Jim Platner, who taught my dad about Jesus, who taught me about Jesus all because these pe people were faithful witnesses who stood in the middle. That's the kind of faithful witness that God wants you and I to be. People who will say, we would rather die than renounce Jesus. If we are that committed to Jesus, if we're that passionate about our faith, we'll have no problem standing in the middle between those who taught us about Jesus and the generation that's coming behind us. The things you've heard me say in the presence of of many witnesses, Paul said, and trust to reliable people. I used to teach homiletics at Great Lakes Christian College. That's the art of preaching. And I taught the advanced homiletics class to juniors and seniors. And I would teach them that when you're looking at the text, don't just look at what's in the text, but look at what's maybe implied by the text or behind the text or maybe what, what you might easily overlook in the text. And there's something we could easily overlook here. Because Paul says, entrust these things to reliable people, that therefore means there must also, by definition, be unreliable people. Which one are you? Entrust these things to reliable people, he said. Can this church rely on you to stand in the middle between the generation that went before and the one that came after? I was last here 35 years ago when this building was dedicated, and the reason you're here today is because somebody stood in the middle. That's why we get to meet today. If I get to come back in 35 years, or more accurately, if my grandchildren happen to be here, will they still find faithful believers gathering every Sunday to worship Jesus and to, to focus on mission? They, they will if you're reliable The things you've heard me say, entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. And that's where we're going to land because I think, for most of us, that's the most difficult part. Entrust to qualified people. I believe that the moment we read that verse, the moment we see that word qualified, the enemy works his way into the conversation and whispers in your ear and in mine, you see, that's the problem. You're not qualified. The moment we read this, I mean, our hearts say, yes, we want to stand in the middle. Yes, we want to show up. Yes, we want to be reliable. Yes, we're listening. But then we read that word, qualified, and we think, I'm not fill in the blank enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not experienced enough. I'm not mature enough. It, I mean, don't we often wrestle? with those feelings of inadequacy and insufficiency when we think about how we can share the message of Jesus to the next generation? Other translations, they translate that uh, qualified. They say, entrust to faithful people who are able to teach others or entrust to faithful people who are competent to teach others. And I'm, I mean, I get it. We str I struggle with that. I know you struggle with that too. Are you qualified? And here's what I want you to know. When the enemy whispers in your ear, you're not filling the blank enough. You're not qualified enough, educated enough, experienced enough, mature enough. When the enemy whispers that in your ear, what I want you to know is that you have every single thing you need to stand in the middle not because you're qualified enough, you're not. Not because you're educated enough, maybe you're not. Not because you're experienced enough, maybe you're not. You have everything you need to stand in the middle, not because of your qualifications, but because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. 
The same Holy Spirit who dwelled inside of Peter and Clement and Ignatius and Polycarp and Irenaeus and a hundred generations of followers after them and Jim Platner and my father and me and my children, the same Holy Spirit that dwells in us dwells in you. And so you have everything you need to stand in the middle. In fact, I'll go so far as to say if some weird virus happened in the world where every Christian on the planet were suddenly wiped out and you were the only one left, you have everything you need to share the message of Jesus Christ to the pagans who remain because you have the Holy Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. You have everything you need. At the end of the day, standing in the middle is a simple thing. We we can make it too difficult. We can make it too hard. At the end of the day, standing in the middle is just teaching somebody how to walk. That's all it is. Teaching someone how to walk. I remember when I learned how to walk. I was about 18 months old. My mother had, we had one of those, um, those uh, metal high chairs, you know, the kind I'm talking about. Some of you remember. Uh, some of you have seen them in vintage stores, right? And the legs, were, the legs were like chrome, and they were like enamel. And, you know, mine, I think, mine was red with a white enamel top. And they had those finger pincher springs on either side. You know, you go to put that thing on there, and you better be careful. You might lose a digit because they're just, right? Uh, this is before OSHA and all that stuff. I mean, we're talking serious stuff, right? My mother, uh, she, I was sitting in the chair. I love it with her. She said, Frank, today's the day. I'm going to teach you perambulation. Now, this is going to require balance, courage, and the ability to lean forward slightly. <laughs> she says, what we're going to do I'm going to put you down, you'll remain vertical, and you will begin to lean forward, and then you'll lift one foot and place it in front of the, others, uh, the other, and then you'll repeat that motion with the opposite foot, and you'll do this over and over and over again, and you'll be walking. And I said, mother, that sounds swell. <laughs> that is not how it happened. I do not remember learning how to walk. And if you tell me you remember learning how to walk, I'm going to say, <laughs> okay, nuclear scientist. I don't remember learning how to walk. But I, somebody taught me, I guess. My mother taught me. I learned. I do, however, remember teaching my children to walk. I have three children. Uh, my oldest went to GLCC. She's now in Australia. She's a third grade teacher living in Australia. I've got two sons. They live here in Michigan. I remember teaching them to walk. And of course, we want to do things, but we want to, you know, the next generation, we want to do it better than the previous generation. And so when Tracy, my wife and I, we decided to teach our children how to walk, we decided to enroll at the local community college in perambulation for infants and toddlers. It was a six-week course, a certificate course. It wasn't really part of any degree-seeking program, which was good because that way we could afford it. And so we joined this course, and it was primary. It was, it was a course that relied a lot on video and, of course, lecture, and there were lessons about, um, phys, you know, from physical therapists about muscle groups and orthopedic stuff and all that. And we studied, and then we sat our daughter down, Abigail, our, young, our eldest, and we said, Abigail, today is the day. We're going to learn perambulation. And good news, Mom and I, are certified. (laughs) That is not how it happened. I want you to know that you have everything you need right now. Every person, literally every person in this room has everything they need to teach a little one how to walk. Two fingers and the ability to bend over. Some of you struggle with that now, right? But Two fingers and the ability to bend over. You have that. You can teach a toddler how to walk because what happens is you bend over and instinctively you put your fingers out. Instinctively, what's the toddler do? (laughs) Grasp onto those and then you just begin to toddle them across the room. And before long, they're no longer walking, they're running, and you're chasing for the rest of their childhood. Friends, that's all standing in the middle is. It's just teaching someone how to walk. It's you looking back at the generation who taught you and saying, you know what, this could be a biological or it could be a spiritual generation, someone who's, you know, you're looking back and you're saying, you know what, I like the way she walks. 
with Jesus. I like the way he walks with God. And so you go to that person, you say, you know what, I like the way you walk with the Lord. Could you teach me how to walk better with Jesus? You find that person, you ask them to show you how to grow your walk with Jesus. But standing in the middle then means you go to the generation coming along behind you. It could be a generation that's physical or it could be a generation that's, that's spiritual and maybe you're not even related biologically, but it's you saying, you know what? I want to teach you how to walk with Jesus. I learned from that person and I'm still figuring it out, but you know, I maybe can teach you how, what I've learned and how I'm walking with Jesus and I'm just going to teach you. That's all it is. Standing in the middle is you teaching one generation what you've learned from the previous generation about how to walk with Jesus. We can overcomplicate it, but at the end of the day, if we're gonna reach a lost world for Jesus, if we're gonna grow the kingdom of God, if we're gonna ensure that the church accomplishes what Jesus commanded us to, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. Brothers, sisters, we need to stand in the middle. I want to pray with you. I thank you, God, for the amazing people who went before me, who taught me about Jesus. I thank you for my dad and my mom. And I thank you that you put Jim Platner in their lives and that he learned from men like Highgates and Lee Doty and Herb McCracken. And I thank you, God, that there were people who taught those gentlemen. And I thank you, God, that we now have the opportunity to stand in the middle, that I can stand in the middle and teach my children, who will teach their children, who will teach people that we've never even met about Jesus, who will teach them how to walk, simply because, not because we're amazing or because we're uber qualified or we're hyper educated, Lord, no, just simply because we faithfully chose to stand in the middle and teach others how to walk the way we've learned how to walk. Lord, this week when the enemy gives us opportunities to show somebody how to walk, or rather when you give us opportunities to show somebody how to walk and the enemy sneaks in and says, you're not qualified, you're not competent, you're not capable, would you remind us that the Holy Spirit dwells within us and that is uh, what makes us capable, that is what makes us qualified. And Lord, would you give us the courage to offer the next generation this week, to offer them the opportunity to learn how to better walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Dr. Weller, for sharing with us. We appreciate it. I was, um, it's communion time in our services, so if you didn't um, yet grab the, the bread and the juice, just raise your hand and our ushers will bring that to you. Um, raise your hand up high. It struck me as, as Dr. Weller, he said to call him Frank, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that, but call him Frank when you talk to him out in the hallway. He does, you stay away from the doctor thing. Um, it struck me as, as you were talking, uh, Frank, that uh, the Apostle Paul did exactly what Frank is talking about. Uh, as, as we get to come to communion time, uh, there, there's a, a place in 1 Corinthians where, he, where Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Paul stood in the middle, right? And he was one of those people in that line of followers of Jesus who passed what he knew on, what was given to him, to the next person. And here's what Paul wrote to the people at Corinth. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that Jesus stood in the middle for us. Right? And Jesus stood in the middle, like literally, between death and us. And what a privilege it is to celebrate uh, what he has done for us today. For I received from the Lord, Paul said, what I also passed on to you, Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread and the juice together this morning.
Amen. I just want to mention a, a couple of quick things. That is, that there are a few things out on the, the registration table in the lobby that I would encourage you to check out, maybe to sign up for, for cleaning, for um, uh, other areas. Jordan, where's Jordan at? Jordan, raise your hand real high. If, you, if you're interested in, uh, in being a part of those teams that are out there, please talk to him and find out what you can do. As a part of our church, we have a, a work day coming up in a couple of weeks on uh, the end of April on a Friday night or Saturday or both, whatever you want to do, we can use your assistance. There's a long list of, of things that we want to work on. So Jordan and Roger will kind of be heading that up, and I um, encourage you to be a part of that. And uh, there was one other thing, but I can't remember it. So come find me afterwards, and maybe I'll know by then. Please stand with us as we finish our time of worship this morning. Now to your 